Right, good morning everyone. It's a bit early in the day, isn't it? Right, I mean, it's, it's, I find it strange that geek camp begins so early. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're fully awake and uh, fully concentrated, concentrating, you can't really be a geek. But anyway, I'm glad to be back. As you can see, I've got last year's t-shirt which shows you that I was here last year. Um, and Geek Camp is always a challenge because it's a very eclectic mix of people with wide interests. Ah, I've got latte as well. Uh, and to try to hold your attention, uh, considering that most of us have ADHD, is a challenge. <laughs> Today I thought I would uh, discuss this whole issue of data with you. I think this is a sufficiently broad topic which will invite questions comments, criticisms, and the rest of it. And remember, we had a robust discussion last year. I hope we'll have the same again this year. Now, my starting point is that data is the new currency. We live, we're supposed to be living in an age of the digital revolution. And beyond just dollars in our pocket, it's really about data being the medium of exchange. But there is one key difference between data and dollars in our pocket. If I give you $2 from my wallet, it's a zero-sum game. You've got $2, I've got $2 less. Data and ideas doesn't obey the law of scarcity. Meaning, if I've got a great idea and I share it with you, and you do something even greater with that, both of us are enriched. It's not a zero-sum game. It doesn't obey the law of scarcity. Now, if you accept that as a starting hypothesis, then what I wanted to discuss today is the Singapore government's attitude to data. And in fact, the champion for data in the Singapore government is not me. It's actually the Prime Minister. He, more than anybody else, has been hectoring, pushing, cajoling, persuading government agencies to open up databases. He, more than anyone else, has said, hold on a minute, it's not enough to just upload PDF files. I want APIs, I want real-time data, I want it machine-readable. As you can imagine, to force government departments to open up data is not something that comes naturally to most governments. But we have done so, and we are progressing at a steady pace. And let me just make two more points about why we believe in a data-driven approach. You know, we just had an election, and I'm not here to conduct an election rally. <laughs> but I want to put to you that Singapore is actually a hacker's nation. We've had to hack our entire system in order for us to be relevant, to be independent, to have a place in a global value chain. Because on its own, in the traditional paradigm, Singapore does not make sense. So the point I'm trying to make is that we are a hacking nation. The next point then is that what you really want from data is to transform that into knowledge, and then you want to transform knowledge into insights and into wisdom. So you see there's a, diff there's a cascade. You know? Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. And the way to do this is first to be open. So make a commitment that we will share as much as possible. Two, to make sure that people can bring their own insights, their own independent perspectives to bear on the data. Three, to generate solutions. The reason I'm emphasizing this is that it gets beyond the zero-sum game of politics, beyond ideology, beyond I win and you lose, to a society, you know, I, li I like to believe in um, an open data and open source society, where we share, we co-create, we solve, and we make things better. So anyway, let me now come quickly to a demonstration which uh, Hong Yi and I are going to make to you today. 
This is uh, it's fairly new, right, Hongi? Uh, not quite launched. Not quite. Yes. Not, not not launched yet. Okay, so it's version zero point <coughs> zero one. Yes. Zero point zero one. But it's live, so you can go on beta b e t a dot data dot gov dot s g. Um, and the reason I got Hong Yi here is because he's the man behind this. So let's start with an example. What what do you think is the biggest grouse Singaporeans have right now? Hey. Haze. Okay, we'll come to that. <laughs> Transport. Right. Let's say before this current episode, transport has been bugging us for a long time. So if you go to this site, look, search for topics, and go to transport and logistics. Okay, one favorite thing is taxi availability. So we are somewhere in the south, right? So if you click on that and keep going, you will see what is them, what is shown here is real time availability of taxis, and you can keep drilling down. It's real time, it's live. The purpose of presenting all this is not to show that it can be done, it is done. We, can, we capture the location of every single taxi, ultimately every single bus, and if you think about it, in theory, every single moving vehicle in Singapore. And the question is not just how to use it, but how would you generate applications knowing that you've got access to all this data? Another example, let's say, Okay, I'm a doctor. Um, medical examples. Let's say you're interested in, what are you interested in? Hospital admissions? What do you, what do you think? Hospitals? Uh, hospital okay, so let me go in. Click on, the uh, Click on that. Uh, on the left. Example, the left of the uh, thing you just clicked. Oh yes, yes, okay. You see, you see I'm, still, I'm still quite green at this. Okay, you wanted hospitals, right? Okay. Again, what you see is it's been broken up into hospitals, into polyclinics, even dental clinics. The data is there, it's the time series. The difference in the past is that we would just download a whole PDF file to you Today, it's categorized, it's accessible through an API. You're not only getting live data, you're also getting access to historical data. And for most people who don't even want to do any hacking, I mean, this sort of stuff is already useful. But the real value is in exposing those data sets and then allowing anyone with even a modicum of programming ability to be able to analyze, derive insights, and co-create uh, solutions. All right, now, I thought I would stop here because I really want Hong Yi to, to present, uh, to get, you know, since you're all geeks, get down dirty. I think he's used an open source software, CCAN, right? Yeah. To, to implement this site. Uh, he's got access to, at the moment, it's about 500 databases. Data sets, we're going to increase that to a thousand and ultimately the entire data set of, of government data that anything short of compromising security will be available. And he'll get down into gory details like whether you should run your Postgres SQL uh, as on an EC2 cloud or whether you're going to use Amazon Relational Database, right? So I can assure you, Hongi, this, this crowd is quite a dirty crowd, so you can afford to get greasy and get, and get down there. So Hongi, why don't you come up and do this? Can you do this too? Yeah, I'll plug it. Uh, okay. And most important, let me get my coffee. <laughs> yep. Can you take it out? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alright, uh, I know you guys see any two sides of that comment, so don't use not that level of information slides, so. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, this is for the recording and live stream. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, here. Okay, back? Sure. Um, hi, so uh, my name's Hong Yi, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm in charge of the data.gov.sg team. Uh, and so the, the thing that's different about our team is that traditionally government, when it does stuff like this, when it builds websites, it basically puts out a contract for, you know, uh, puts out a tender and gets vendors all to try and build it. Uh, but we're part of a new team within government. We're located at Fusionopolis. Uh, and 
the whole goal of our new team is to sort of build stuff in-house because you're realizing, actually, there's a lot of things that, especially in terms of software, it's better to iterate and quickly sort of change and test things out rather than to go through a whole, like, specifying a massive 400-page tender document and get it back, like, two years later, and it's not what you want. So our team's in-house. Uh, it's me and uh, four other guys. Uh, we got one guy, we got uh, we got uh, one engineer working on uh, we got one engineer working with me uh, on implementing the site. We've got one engineer who's working on infrastructure and deployment, uh, and we've got two analysts. Uh, one who was a uh, sort of econ background, econ and finance background, and one from the Straits Times. So like, um, it's a it's a good mix of sort of engineering slash data analytics. Uh, and the goal of our new site, basically, uh, let me, well, I might as well bring up the actual site, uh, is as as Mr. Vivian said, um, is to not just list data. It's not just to sort of put it up on the site, because the current data that got the SG exists. The current data that got the SG has a whole bunch, has 8,000 different data sets. The problem is that they all exist as like PDF files, like weird tab separated values, or some, someone's like literally Excel spreadsheet with all kinds of like caveats and notes all over the place. And it's really, really, really hard. Oh, sorry, I should talk yeah, into this and this. Small, it's small because it's Okay. Um, it's really hard to access. And so the goal of our new site, the mission of our new site, is to help people understand and use public data. The keywords being understand and use. So not just technically putting it there and say, okay, hence, you know, job's done, go home, but making it our mission to make sure people understand and the public, more importantly, understand what's going on. And so we focused a lot on visualizations, as you can see with charts, and we've got visualizations for each of the subtopics. Um, so for, for example, health and safety. And we also, do articles. So longer form articles, you've got a blog. And this is stuff that we do, all this in analytics we do within government anyway. This is stuff we're doing for LTA. Uh, we're trying to figure out how the bus routes are, are, are working. And just to understand this graph, you have a whole bunch of dots representing the stops on a bus route, and a line between them represents someone traveling between them. And the whole, if you just look at this visualization, you can see that bus routes are not even throughout. You, know, you can probably trim some edges here and there. You can maybe separate some into two. You can maybe join other bus routes together. There's a whole bunch of efficiency gains that can be made once you look at the data. And we do this all the time in government anyway. We do, every ministry has analysts, has staffers doing all this work. But rather than keeping it private and locked up, we want to share it with the public. And that's kind of the goal of the site. So we have the short form stuff in terms of like, uh, in terms of dashboards, and we have the long form analysis in terms of these articles. Uh, and so that's kind of the goal of the site overall. Um, but we're not just focusing just on the public, we're trying to make, we're trying to make uh, our APIs better too. Um, so as, as Minister showed us earlier, um, this is real-time taxi data. So LTA has this feed, and they've had it for a little while now. Um, the problem with it is that the semantics around the feed weren't very good. So you would get a subset of taxis every time, and, 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 this, this, and one very key uh, important thing that was missing from the API was that they didn't have any historical data. They just, you could make a request and you could get the current list of taxis, but if you, uh, but, but if for example, you wanted taxis, how many taxis there were on November 25th um, last year, you're out of luck. With our, what we've done is we've implemented a layer on top of that which caches all the previous historical information, provides a common API across agencies, so like NEA and LTA and everything theoretically accessible using the same key. And very importantly, we, we keep that historical record. So we're actually running our own database, which is caching all of this, so you can make historical requests for, for a lot of analytics of what happened with the taxis, like if there was a huge shortage like two weeks ago or something like that. Uh, so this is kind of what we're doing with the site in terms of a user perspective. I can talk, I'm going to talk a little bit now, since you guys are a more technical crowd, uh, about how we're, how we're implementing it. Um, just to, yeah. So features. Um, so yeah, so the site pretty straightforward. It's built on this open source framework called uh, CCAN. Uh, it's something knowledge network, yes, yeah, not knowledge archive network. Um, it's pretty useful. It's, uh, they use it in a few places. Uh, Data.gov, the US one uses this, the UK one uses this, and I think the UN, like, the, the UN uh, open data thing uses this as well. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Um, it gives us a good framework. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have, uh, you know, you have topics, groups, data sets, some, uh, some access control layers built in, uh, and it's all built on Python. Um, and we basically think this is our foundation, and we built on top of that. Um, so, let me see, yes. So on top of that, so, so with, together with CCAN, uh, CCAN unfortunately doesn't contain, uh, doesn't contain any sort of like, uh, what, you, what you would call, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, CMS. Like, so you, it was hard for us to implement articles and things like that. And so what we've done is we've implemented simultaneously CCAN as well as maintain a mezzanine server for a blog. And then it programmatically, call, one, programmatically CCAN calls mezzanine in order to retrieve the articles and you know, images and all that sort of thing. So we, it's basically two systems running in parallel. 
Um, and then for visualizations, uh, you guys are probably familiar with D3 if you've heard of it before, if you do any type of digital visualization. It's a pretty low level library. Uh, one of the things that we've found with D3 is that, um, yeah, it's, it's literally like, it's literally like, you know, draw line, draw line, draw things, specify. It's, 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 it's a bit, it's a bit crude. So we're trying to move away from, so we started off doing that and we realized because we, Suck. We have a lot of bugs, so we uh, we started. We, we, we're trying to we're trying to check out a couple of other libraries now, which are sort of smart around this. Because it turns out drawing a graph is actually pretty hard. Who knew? Um, so <laughs> so there we go. Uh, and yeah, for visualizations, use the Google Map Google Maps API. Um, so basically, yeah, it, it, it's uh, the one of the things one of the problems you had was that with with, uh, with a lot of the government data, it's on all kinds of like proprietary. So it's on one map, or it's on like the URA special mapping thing, and it's some weird format. And so we've standardized. Uh, Google Maps is a very popular open thing. They use a KML layer, so it's pretty standard, uh, and you can visualize with whatever you want. Um, so yeah, that's what we're using for the mapping API. Uh, so here's the cool. So here's the sort of like meat and potatoes of it, the infrastructure. Um, sorry and. Uh, let me uh, tell me if I'm going too fast because I am trying to be aware of time and leave some time for Q and A. So if I'm speeding no, too this, quickly, this, this is the pace they like. Okay. Uh, all right. So infrastructure. So we are deployed uh, surprisingly for most government agencies on AWS. And uh, so if, if, any, if any of you have worked with, uh, have any of you worked on like government like IT projects before? Yeah. All right. <laughs> have you used like, G Cloud? Yeah. Yeah. G Cloud's fun, isn't it? Um, so. <laughs> Yes, G Cloud is a lot of fun. Um, G Cloud is what most government projects use. It's uh, it's kind of like AC2. It's kind of like AWS for government agencies. Only probably about a hundred to a thousand times more expensive and a hundred thousand times harder to use. Um, so you get one ten thousandth the efficiency. Uh, but 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 luckily because we're working on open data and a lot of government agencies need this because secrecy and all this other stuff. But luckily because we're working on open data, we don't care. You can hack us. You can take everything we have. We're publishing it anyway, and that's basically what we want. Um, so. Yes, we're running on we're running on AWS. We got EC2 servers running the core the core stuff. Uh, we're running RDS for databases. Um, I'm assuming that you guys know what AWS is, right? Yes, should okay, cool. Um, sorry, I'll I'll go into the details of why we're doing this in a bit. Uh, we're running VPCs, so we have separate we have separate uh, production and deployment uh, deployment VPCs. Uh, we're using yeah, and we're using the DNS services here. Okay, so to go to dive a bit more into how each of these systems work. Uh, so EC2, actually, wait, I have a, yeah. So EC2 is where we run, let me jump back, yes. EC2 is where we run uh, CCAN, is where we run CCAN and Mezzanine. Basically, we have, it's pretty straightforward, you have EC2 instances, you're, you, you're, you, you run simultaneously CCAN and Mezzanine on the same instances, and we have this replicated across two VPCs. Um, RDS, uh, so we, yeah, we're using the, so RDS is a bit of an interesting thing, so uh, we're running actually two sets of databases. We have the set of databases, which, uh, which is sort of for the site itself. So CCAN itself has your know, databases, the list of data sets and all that sort of thing. Uh, and for that, we're just using our RDS PostgreSQL database. Um, on the other hand, one, but, uh, but for our API, so for example, we were working with, uh, because for the real-time APIs, we are historically caching a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and it turns out it's a lot of data, and it needs to be scalable pretty quickly. And the RDS stuff, not that it's not scalable, it's not that we, ex you know, we're, we're great, we're bigger than Amazon, but that if you want to scale it up, it's uh, you need to like shut off the instance, turn it on, and do some other things. And I know they're experimenting with some no SQL stuff, but for now, what we've done for that is instead instead of using RDS, uh, we've set up. Uh, you guys know what Cassandra is. Yeah, we've set up some Cassandra instances uh, just so that if we wanted to, we can dynamically add servers because we really have no idea how big the data we're handling is right now because we haven't quite fully gone live yet. So we have that as an approach. Um, yes, there we go. Ah, yes, and this is why, and, and the reason why we're using, uh, we're using it as a RDS as a service instead of running our own AC2 instance with the RDS installed because, well, it's just easier and why, why do the work? Um, yes, it's got all this good stuff. Uh, okay. VPCs, ah yes. So the VPCs are quite interesting, and I wish, actually I have it somewhere later in the slide. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um, yeah, so you go. So this right here is our VPC deployment infrastructure. Um, so if you look at this, uh, what we've done is we've done a, 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 it's pretty standard, I guess, for deployment stuff, but if you, it, for, for like production uh, environments, but if you haven't worked in sort of production software before, uh, the basic idea is that you, we, have, we, have, we have two uh, identical VPCs, uh, virtual private clouds, essentially, like, like networks. So within the VPC, there's a set of computers and they all, they, they, they all assume that they, they don't know whether they're living in production or, 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 or dev. 
Um, when we push to our when we push when we push to our uh, CI server, it deploys some. It first deploys to uh, the Dev VPC because it, it takes the it takes the master branch, pushes out to the Dev VPC, and when we finally decided that it's re relatively safe, we just do a merge into the production branch and then we go to the production VPC. Um, so the idea here is that it provides us isolation between the two and we can test things before they go out, um, which is pretty fun. Um, so yeah, the in terms of how how the sites deploy. Basically, what we do now is uh, rather, one of the things I, I found interesting about working government is that a lot of engineers working government hadn't heard of a code review before, um, which was a bit surprising. Um, yeah, yeah uh, no, but, but because this, this whole idea that software is sort of this arcane thing, right? That, 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 the, that the approach generally is that it's software is this arcane thing where like you have an engineer and he works on it and oh, is it ready? Is it not? Has it met the requirements on the thing? Uh, and then you just launch. But, uh, so what we've done is we've set up a Git server, hopefully, and we do code reviews now, so that's good. Uh, and we've set up a, 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 a CI pipeline. Uh, so basically, quite straightforward. Uh, when we launch, uh, when we uh, when we push, we will push to our we'll push to our Git slash CI server. Uh, the CI server takes a look at the branch. It on the master branch, it just pushes to our dev environment. And so we have a we have a dev version which I can show you actually. So it looks slightly different, as you can see. We're testing some stuff out, um, and. Wait, where is this? Yeah, we have a we have a dev version, and that is and, and that's where we test to. And then when we decide to just do a merge, we just do merge to master, merge to production, and then off it goes into live world. Um, so these are the two main things. Ccan is the Ccan is the main infrastructure. Solar is the search server. RDS is RDS, as you know. Um, and then on top of that, we're backing everything up to S3 and Glacier. So one of the things we are trying to figure out is the backup strategy. Um, so. The backup strategy is actually quite, so one of the things uh, Amazon has launched recently, well not recently, I guess over a year ago now, is Glacier. Uh, have you guys heard of Glacier? Yeah, yeah. so uh, the good thing about Glacier, well the, the, good, the, the Glacier is super slow but very cheap. And the super slow meaning like several hours before you get access, and that's really, really good for us because one of the things we're trying to figure out if let's say the site is, a lot of, the gov a lot of government sites, they're backed up at a, on a replicated level. So they like, oh, how is it backed up? We just have like three versions of the database and everything like that. Problem is that that doesn't protect you against application level failures. So yes, if your hardware explodes, then you have another piece of hardware, great. But if let's say something screws up in CCAN or someone hacks the site and like, uh, and changes everything to like just porn, then well, <laughs> then you're screwed because all your databases now are just full of crap, right? Um, <laughs> So one of the things we've done is we've done offline backup. So the whole the, the S, uh, glacier being a sort of like very very slow thing, like with batch and then we you know it's put aside and you, you you have to take like several hours to retrieve it up. is actually good for us because then uh, because if something like massively terrible goes wrong, the fact that you can't get to glacier until like six seven hours later is a good thing. Um, <laughs> and so that's our backup. Uh, yes, and as and, sim and similarly we've got a, a whole bunch of Cassandra clusters here on the right uh, that, that we're running for the real time API. Um, let me see, what else should we talk about? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, yes, and we are using Docker. Um, have you guys heard of Docker? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, does anyone here not know about Docker? All right. Uh, so just very quickly, Docker is a way of doing kind of like a virtual machine, but not quite a virtual machine. So traditionally, you would, have the you would just clone the entire damn Linux server, right? You would just have four copies of the entire damn Linux server, and if thing goes down, you, just, you, you, know, you, you, you set it to fire, you set fire on it, and you bring up, bring up a whole new one. Uh, the problem is these are really, really large, heavy, multi-gigabyte things. Docker is great because what it means is that we just have the, we just maintain essentially the delta, the difference between a core Linux installation and what we want, a uh, Unix, I guess. I'm not sure if it's not Unix, Unix or Linux layer, but anyway, we maintain that difference and then we just deploy it and then we just deploy it uh, whenever we need to. So, yeah, so everything right now is running on Docker. Basically, all this stuff that's that installed by default, we just put into a Docker file and then we just push out. So the whole, theoretically, this means that even though we're deployed in AWS, we're not tied to <coughs> AWS in any means because we're just using the EC2 servers to run essentially Docker servers and our CI server doesn't actually need to like have root access into like our, you know, our AWS credentials and everything. Our CI server just needs to have, uh, just needs to have access to the Docker, um, the Docker credentials and whenever we push, yeah, whenever we push code to GitLab, uh, yeah, it gets deployed. Um, 
via Docker, and it's worked out great. Uh, it means everything's a lot faster. It means that previously when we were doing development, um, a, a lot of government, so, so this is something that I, I was going to, uh, so a lot of government agencies, they, they seem to have a problem with deployment and services. So you know, they'll test, develop, and then when they want to deploy, it's a, like a week-long affair where like, okay, we're going to do deployment this week, guys. <laughs> and then you buckle down and you shut down the servers, and then you hope nothing explodes, and then like halfway through you realize that you're not in any state that you recognized before, and then you cry. Um, but with Docker, it's great. Literally, like I push changes, I press commit, and then like literally a minute later, it's up on the dev, uh, is up, up, on the, up on the dev server. Um, and same for production. It means that right now, when we want to, when we see something's good on dev, and we want to push production, theoretically, all we do is click merge, and then it's gone live. Um, now that being said, that gives you some issues because you have environmental variables and all that, and occasionally something like funny goes wrong. But like theoretically, it, it works, and it actually works pretty good. Um, so so yeah, that's our. Um, that's our deployment infrastructure. I don't know if this is interesting to you. This, this is the specifics of how it works. Um, yeah, basically, we push to GitLab. GitLab triggers a webhook, and it pulls stuff back. I mean, all bunch of, it's roundabout ways of triggering things, but essentially, it's done automatically. So I have no idea what you're waving back at me. <laughs> ten, ten ah, OK, cool. Uh, all right, so I feel like I, there's a lot of stuff, as you can see, and I'm kind of rushing through because I'm not sure what to cover. But I will leave, given that we have 10 minutes remaining, I guess I will leave time for questions and maybe answer things. Yes? Are restrictions to API calls? Restrictions to API calls, what do you mean? How many times do you call it? Ah, yes. Uh, so we were thinking about this quite heavily because implementing, because it's very easy to have an open API, and once you put in restrictions, it makes it infinitely harder. Um, so we have some like sanity bounds right now, uh, and we are looking at how we can expand that. Um, so there are two things. There are two things you're looking at when you're restricting API calls. One is you are protecting against malicious intent. So if someone really just doesn't like you and just wants to like hammer your server and do all kinds of things, then you don't want to let them do that. Um, Normally, if I, were, if I was a private citizen, then no one would care because you just have this funny little data sharing site. But if you are a government agency, turns out some people just really hate anything with a .gov at the end, and, <laughs> they, will, uh, and they will make it their life's mission to make your life miserable. Uh, so we have a few restrictions there. Uh, the, other, the other sort of more happy approach is trying to figure out um, track users. So this is all like, you know, this is kind of like the survey thing you do when you go shop on a site. Uh, we want pe we're pe people are making API calls, but we want to have some sense of like what they're doing it for. And so we've implemented a uh, lightweight registration thing so that everyone has a unique key and we can shut it off if necessary. But pretty much if you're not doing anything insane and malicious, you should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Are you going to bring this in, uh, within the country itself instead of sitting on Amazon from a data with uh, sovereignty <coughs> Oh yeah, so we are hosted within. Uh, so we are hosted within the Singapore zone of AWS. So uh, in terms of like, if it's physically located in Singapore, that's fine. Uh, within the country itself, we don't particularly care uh, because because we are we have the we have the wonderful benefit of nothing on our site being sacred. Like really, there's nothing secret. There's nothing hidden. It's all there. I mean, as long as you don't steal our Amazon API key and like spin up ten billion dollars worth of you know of Bitcoin mining machines, we don't care. Um, and. And yeah, and, and, and as we said, we, because we're running on Docker and a bunch of these other sort of like intermediate layers, we can switch from AWS to, for example, DigitalOcean if we wanted to, uh, and, it, and it wouldn't take us very much effort at all. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Question, yes. Is a site source code open source? Uh, right now, no, uh, because we are still dicking around with it, and we don't feel it is in any state that we want people to look at it just yet. Uh, but eventually, yes. Uh, it's pretty simple, though. Most of it, we're, like, we're pretty much running uh, CCAN with a with a bunch of templates and JS changes. Nothing terribly, uh, nothing terribly deep. We have one or two changes, which, for example, we one one of the things we are planning open sourcing is this approval framework. So um, CCAN is got two modes right now. It's got totally private where you log in and you do, and then it's got totally open where anyone can upload whatever the hell they want because it's open knowledge framework. Uh, now you can imagine the problem is completely open. Um, so we've developed this plugin, which does an intermediary thing where if people upload it, it doesn't straight go live. It goes to the administrators of the site so they can see what it is um, before it goes. Uh, and so that's something that we think could be useful for people doing this in general. And yeah, we plan on sharing that. Um, yes? Is there any license on the data reuse? Yes, uh, there is some right now. It's the, the, so, so it's a bit more restrictive than we would like. So that's sort of a more historic thing where the government was kind of a Yes, yeah, 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 as Mr. said, it's, it's, a, it's, a more it's a little more sort of like anxious than, than we would like, and we're trying to open it up right now. Um, uh, on that, can I... Uh, 
request specifically that uh, Creative Commons attribution be considered. Yes, absolutely. That would be in terms of getting yeah, yeah, I the law to say what are the attributions we've done, and you can integrate with other sources. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh yes. Uh, bef if anyone has any questions for Minister as well, like please, like <laughs> I'm, you know. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> different data formats and different data sources because I assume you get a lot of data from different source sources you know, clean it up and format it in some nice fashion which you can query and use. So how do you guys manage that? I assume it's quite complicated even that you have so this is the hardest part of our job, quite frankly. Um, so all this stuff is quite, it looks well and good. And you know, ideally, we would just put together this site and say, hey, agencies, give us your data, and everything will be free and open. Turns out that most of how the government works is not databases. Turns out most of how the government works is people's Excel files on their desktops. Um, and so, and so yeah, yeah, or worse, yeah, Word documents, God. Word, Word, ta Word tables are the best. Um, but, the, the way, so we've, we've actually done, so we've published, we're, we're taking a few steps to do this. This is a community thing rather than a technological problem. So we published a data sharing guide. Uh, well, we've got a version one of it, sort of like we're circulating within government and we're trying to get some feedback on it. But the, it's a sort of standardized way of how you're supposed to format your data. So for example, like don't have like ridiculous nested merged rows. Like it's, we're following the, I think it's called the tidy data format, if you guys have heard of it. Um, to try and make it clean and so it's, it's, a, it's a standard. Like, and we're trying to come up with basic standards for um, how, to put, how to write dates, for example, like whether month and year should be the same column or different columns. Uh, and we are working currently within IDA and with uh, DOS, Department of Statistics, right now, and to sort of get this a bit consolidated. And uh, as, we, as we move on to pull other agencies in, we're trying to get them to comply with all this. Um, the unfortunate truth is that it is very manual and takes a lot of social engineering to get people to sort of like accept these things. So. Yes, yes, the people are, yes, probably between keyboard and chair. Yes. Do I have tests? Yes. Tests for what? A whole bunch of things. Yeah. I mean, tests for whether you're able to read that data, whether you know, your code can still read it. Ah, yeah. So the. The problem is that you can, so there are tests. There are, CSV, there are CSV linting tools, obviously. So there's a whole bunch of CSV validation tools. There's a bunch of stuff you can do to make sure that it's like a valid file format and not a virus. And like, you know, there's like simple, very low level things you can check. The problem isn't the low level stuff. The problem is the high level semantic stuff. So for example, when MOE says a, ch a child and MOH says a child, they could mean entirely different things. Um, when, DOS, when DOS publishes some numbers, they don't just publish the numbers, they, they want to publish the numbers as well as have like a very big footnote about how these are calculated and that these are estimates based on whatever projection because for them, that's very, very, very crucial and important. So how do you include that into your metadata? Because saying 10,000 doesn't mean anything to them unless it comes with a, you know, with a, a normal distribution and variance and all that sort of thing. Um, so it's a semantic effort, it's the semantic elements that make it harder, um, but yes. So, do you have any intention of putting the elections data on it? Elections data. Yeah. Well, we, if we get it, we would love to. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so just to, just to clarify our role, we we would want to share all the data we can get our hands on. But unfortunately, as uh, we are five engineers and two analysts, we do not own the data. So we will we try very hard to cajole agencies to share as much as they can. And as Minister Vivian said, it's a whole of government effort to cajole as much data as we can. And another question would be because the election data is ELB.gov. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so whatever is open will be open. Yeah. And is it we can assess it really. So if yeah. we have we have the data in a specific format that fits. Uh, your requirements, and we have certain analysis that we have uh, made. Yes. Is there a way to channel it to you? Ah, uh, yes. So, uh, if you are within the government and you want to share data with us, we are very, very, very happy to have it. If you are outside of the government, right now we do not have an avenue. We we are we are looking into that. That's why we said we had the approval framework to get it submitted. Um, so the reason why we are not taking stuff from the public just yet is because we are trying to be exclusive rather than inclusive. So one of the problems with the current site is there are 8,000 data sets. And with 8,000 data sets, more than half of them have never been downloaded, not once. Um, there are data sets on the current site, which there's one data set which is wonderful. It says, that it's got two cells, it says water quality 100%, and that's it. <laughs> that's the entire data set. And you don't know what the hell that means, but there, that's water quality 100%. There you go. Um, so as you can imagine, having a site full of this stuff is, makes it uh, makes it a bit user. So, so we're taking the sort of like cautious approach of letting stuff in which we know is high value first. And once we sort of established ourselves, then we start taking the data from public. In terms of an analytics, if you really have a whole bunch of stuff you want to share, please do join our team. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of stuff being available on the election side, you know, this, is, this is what I was saying. Like, there's all this data in government. Unfortunately, it's, if it was just the database and they gave us a key, we would love to pull it in, but it often is someone's spreadsheet or piece of paper, and so we're trying to yeah, set up pipelines. Um, For real-time data sets like the taxi locations and things like that, how do you uh, control or understand like, how frequently you track that data? Like, maybe do you do it once a minute, or how do you decide? <clears throat> ah, yes. So this is a lot of lies and trickery. Um, basically, the, so theoretically, taxis are supposed to report their data every 30 seconds, theoretically. In practice, we've found it to be two minutes, sometimes worse. Um, and we poll. Uh, it's, it's not pretty, it's not great, but we poll. We, 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 we calibrate and we try polling at the frequency that they tell us, and then we scale it up by a little bit just to make sure we catch everything. Um, sometimes the, so, so for example, one of the problems with the LTA API that we, that we had was that uh, they do not give the taxi locations, but they do not give unique identifiers to the taxis, which means that you don't know whether you've got a whole different set of taxis or you've got the same taxi in a different location, and so you guess. Um, so, yes, you would, uh, ideally we would live in a push, in, in a push data scenario, and so with, uh, we're working with NEA uh, right now to figure it out, because NEA has a whole bunch of data, and we're trying to, we're trying to set it such that when there's an update, they tell us. Um, but as it is, we scrape, we pull, and we beg. <coughs> yes. We can take one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, all right, if no one... Sorry, I have some, someone who hasn't asked before, yes. Okay, uh, what's the size of the data that you have right now? The size? Yes. I don't know. What do you mean by size? In terms of like... How many gigabytes? Uh, it depends. So the actual data sets themselves is pretty small because we've, we've only got a couple hundred megabytes on the site itself. Uh, if you're talking about the real-time stuff, then that's pretty large, but that would, that's like growing every day. So it's, I, I, I can't remember how many days we've been running. You take the num you, you, I have to estimate how large it was and then multiply it by how many days it's been since then. Um, we've got... I, it's, not, it's, not in the, it's not in the multi, multi terabyte range yet, uh, but we anticipate it will be. Yeah, it's cheap anyway, so we don't particularly care. Uh, questions? Okay. Do you do um, predictions? And if you do, do you think the government will ever use the data? So this is the fun question. Um, so turns out that the easiest thing to do before you start doing predictions is figure out where the hell you are. Um, because for a lot of, so, so, so when people talk about big data, they're talking about how we can predict the future, right? If you get all this stuff, you can figure out whether people are going to be Facebook in two years or whether someone's going to buy diapers when you know, they're pregnant or something like that. Um, but the, in, in, before we get there, one of the things you're focusing on is right now just visibility. Because you have all these, so, so for example, hospital beds. Um, you have a whole bunch of people at MOH, and, but if you ask the average MOH employee, like a staffer, like how many hospital beds are free, they would have no idea. They would theoretically know where to get it from. They would like, yeah, let me check with my staffer, let me check with my colleague here and there. Um, but it's not their fingertips. And so we're focusing very much on just having visibility so that if you are working in the, if you're working in the Ministry of Transport, you should know like that how many, how many buses are on at this time. At the, at this time. Um, so visibility is the first thing. And for, in terms of predictions, so we can do, it's a, it's a, it's a hard question because uh, if you're trying to do stuff 10 years from now, very hard. If you're trying to do stuff one day from now, very easy. So one of the things we're working on as a team, not data.gov specifically, but as like the data science group within government, is we're working on this thing called Pulse of the Economy, where the idea here is that if you try and do economic predictions, uh, you take, it, it takes years, right? You, you gather last year's data, then you spend six months analyzing, then you argue over whether it's accurate, and then like you publish, these are like the economic predictions for, this is how we were running, like, this is how the economy was doing last year, this is our GDP estimates, but this takes, this is like a yearly cycle, and it's a whole year's worth. Um, one of the things we're looking at is if we take a look at, let's say, electricity usage, transport usage, um, you know, general expenditure, uh, like hospital admissions, like some sort of day-to-day -day sort of things that you can monitor, hell, even PSI maybe, um, you can come up with a, you can come up with a, a reasonable estimate of your day-to-day -day GDP. Because um, so, you, know, you run these correlations for long run. And so what we could theoretically then do, and what we're trying to do, is not so much six, seven months from now, or even a year from now, or even, two day, or even like a month from now, but like if we looked at what's going on now, we could have kind of like a spider sense thing of like, just near future, what's, how's the GDP going to show up, given that there's a whole bunch of traffic, given that there's a whole bunch of electricity usage in the factories, for example. Um, and it won't be completely accurate, it won't be as good, but if we get it working, you can have a, yeah, you can have a short, you can have short term predictions yeah, for visibility more than uh, long term, long term trends, yes. Um, all right, I guess, do I have time for one last one? One last one, preferably from the back, because most of the guys in the back haven't asked anything. Yeah, anyone? If not, Harish? Yeah. Uh, um, I just looked at the CCAN code base. Yes. Uh, it's on uh, Apero GPL. So if you're updating, changing the CCAN code base to add stuff to it, you, know, you should actually be feeding it upstream. 
Yes, yes. Uh, so we're not so we're not modifying CCAN itself specifically. What we are doing is we are working on the extension framework. So they have a whole bunch of plugins and things like that. Uh, and so that's the that's the path we're using rather than modifying the core code. Yes. All right. Uh, with that, I don't. Uh, I'll give Minister a chance to talk. I, I won't take up too much time. Thank you. I think what uh, Hongi has given you is just a foretaste of how much better we can make government, in fact more than government, how much better we can make in Singapore if we only use our data in a sensible way, in an open way, and we shared the, the insights. Uh, and I know I'm not supposed to sell down here, but uh, if any one of you has uh, is smarter or faster or more technically inclined at Hongi, please let us know. Uh, as you can see, it's just seven people and what they're really trying to do is to hack the government. And uh, if we get more hackers to hack the government and ultimately the country, I think we'll be even better off. Uh, the final point, and this is about you know, publishing your stuff. Um, we do need to have semi-permeable membranes. So if it's data.gov.sg, that is data from the government. Now that doesn't mean we're not interested in your insights and your analysis and your shared data pools. I think we will look into that because ultimately what we want is data.sg. It's not just data.gov.sg. So GeekCam is part of this movement. We really believe in open data, we do believe in open source and what we're really trying to do, and I think Harish will agree with me, we're really trying to open source our country because we believe that sharing data, sharing ideas, co-creating solutions will allow us to make Singapore a unique and really future-oriented entity. And in the world now, you know, whether you're facing haze or sustainability or inequality, um, or climate change. So much can be achieved if we truly operate on these principles of opening data, sharing solutions, picking the best, and continuing to evolve. But so much of the way governments have been structured and organized in the past really do not take advantage of what technology has to offer. All right, so our Smart Nation effort is a small team, but we're trying to internally hack and hopefully ultimately transform government, transform Singapore, and perhaps even show relevance to the rest of the world of how you would future-proof your city and your entity. So please watch this space, continue to stay engaged with us, and the more complaints and demands you put to us, it's fine. It's also a data point, and it makes us better as well. So thank you all very much for your attention, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you.